Sir. I am the Deputy Dean here for Digital Learning and Executive Education. And it's my immense pleasure uh, to welcome Dr. Ramaswamy Balasubrabanyam. I also call him Balu, which is what I'm going to call you for the rest Please. of the uh, session. Uh, I wanted to introduce to you, uh, you know, uh, the incredible person that Balu is. And I'm looking forward to the next 45 odd minutes of engaging in a discussion, a freewheeling discussion, Balu, on yeah. uh, new uh, rethinking uh, leadership in the public sector. A uh, brief introduction, uh, Dr. Ramaswamy Balasubramanyam is a development scholar, author, public policy advocate, a leadership trainer known for his pioneering development work with rural and tribal people in Karnataka. Uh, he is currently serving as the member HR of the Capacity Building Commission. As you know, this was formed under the Mission Karma Yogi of the Government of India. Uh, Balu has founded the Swami Vivekananda Youth Movement. It's a development organization when he was 19. Wow. After spending 26 years in development work amongst rural and tribal people, he pursued academic degrees in leadership, org development, and public policy. He was the Frank Rhodes Professor at Cornell University between 2012 and 14, and he continues to hold academic positions yeah. uh, at Cornell uh, and other universities as well, where he visits to teach. His books, Voices from the Grassroots and I, the Citizen, are a compilation of narratives and reflections of a development expert and are globally acclaimed works. He is also the founder and chairman of Grassroots Research and Advocacy Movement, a public policy think tank based out of Mysore. Inspired by the message of Swami Vivekananda, he sees his life's mission as building a resurgent India by inspiring leadership in the youth of the country. I typically don't want to see what you see as life's mission, but you know, uh, we're going to say that anyway. Welcome, yeah. Balu. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you so much, Deepa, for, for yeah. having me here. Thank you. I wanted to kick off by, you know, this is, this is, of course, a topic, just given your current capacity, which is something which will be very valuable to get your comments on. And you know, let's start, I thought, with public sector leadership and looking at its evolution. Uh, you know, one of the definitions in the OECD report on public sector leadership, reinventing public sector leadership, uh, I liked what they said, Balu, which was about drawing others into a spirit of public service, right? drawing uh, f the relevant people in government into a spirit of public service that's geared to the needs of contemporary society and therefore renders services more effectively. How have you seen this construct evolve over time? No, I think uh, possibly I'll, I'll sort of stick my answer to the Indian narrative. Of course. Uh, one is a civilizational piece. I won't get in there. I'll just go in from the time we were independent as a country yeah. and the last 75 years of our evolution in the public space. Now, we all, it's, it's all in context. The definition of OECD is absolutely right, but then there's an expansive understanding of public itself today. Correct. correct. And therefore, the, 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 the whole dynamics changes. If you look at India, when we got our freedom, uh, by the sheer necessity of the times, the state had to provide everything. And we inherited a civil service, a public sector leadership, which was trained originally for a different purpose. But we had to, it was what it was, and we, had to in, we inherited them. And the whole mandate at that point of time was to provide, because the country was in a bad shape, and people had to provide. So whether it was knowing how to make breads in a bakery to running an airport to doing everything the state had to take on the leadership. So you needed a set of people whose mandate was to provide to citizens. So providing was the mandate and so leadership was built on how do I provide more efficiently and effectively. But then if you looked at our own evolution as a country in the 90s and when a lot of things rapidly changed and we were trying to catch up with the rest of the world, privatization, globalization, etc. What people missed to understand was these are words which are all external, but the system needed to have the capacity to deliver on that, which means suddenly we became from a provider approach to a provisioning approach. The private sector had to grow up and they grew very fast to respond to the needs of the nation, but the public sector it also had to evolve suddenly, drop all of its image of providing and become a provisioner and learn the skill sets of provisioning. It took a decade or two for people to fall in line. But then, currently, if you look at our national narrative, if you look at all the statements the Prime Minister keeps making, it's about citizens engaging. It's about ease of living. Right. It's about Jan Bagidari, which immediately means we are moved from providing to provisioning to partnering. And hmm. partnering is a completely different mindset. It's not only a different toolbox that you need to have, it's also a different mindset itself. Hmm. So getting the state and the public sector leadership to appreciate this distinction and difference and differentiate themselves to deliver on this mandate that is that is how it's evolving today. So to me, public sector leadership is much more complex 
than just saying that okay my citizens need to be provided for and so I can do eight things I've done my job. Today you're operating in a world which is rapidly changing. You're under constant scrutiny. Hmm. The demands of transparency are so much on you and you're also world dealing with the world of emerging technologies and cap maximizing the the potential and the productivity of these technologies for whatever you're doing. And the citizens, we, we can't forget, we're also a very rapidly maturing democracy, very articulate, loud democracy, and social media has made it louder. And so demands of citizens have become extremely complex. And this demands of also, and this uh, citizens' expectations are also the demands will be met. You know, it's a funny thing, they, 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 they don't want government in their lives, but they want government to do everything in their lives. Hmm. Hmm. This phase of citizenship, and hmm. so in that particular point of time that we exist in today, delivering on public sector leadership is a—it's it, quite a task. And to complicate things, COVID happened. Right. right. And so to me, COVID was a reset button, and uh, at least in our country, and I'm—I'm—I can say it very proudly the way our public sector rose to the occasion. Not just the public health sector; I think the entire public sector rose to the occasion nationally and in several states. Uh, we need to really learn from what happened, what worked. And the messages I draw for public sector leadership are from these success stories of the last two years. So, you know, you obviously pointed out the, there are several factors that are changing in the world around us. We talked about increased transparency, growing citizen awareness, the role of technology. A lot of these factors that have led public sector leadership to be reinvented or redesigned for a new world, right? And you would also agree that this, I mean, this is clearly, you know, just the institution that you're a part of is a reflection of, you know, that, that kind change. of reinvention yeah. and change, right? And this is not India's experience alone. There is a lot of, there's, there's a, there are calls around the world for public sector leadership to be reinvented and redesigned. Uh, so is, uh, these changes that you're seeing, I'm assuming that some of these are what is driving it around the world, right? Now. If, if public sector leadership needs to change, what are some of the underlying principles that you're seeing change? For instance, I'll just give you an example of what I'm talking about, right? So uh, there's earlier when you're providing, and in some sense you're in a resource-constrained economy or whatever, and you're providing, there is a need for everyone you're leading to follow you. So the need of the hour is compliance. But, you know, I remember in our conversations you've talked about now moving from that follower mindset who complies to a more of you know getting people on board through commitment through arousing their inner purpose and you know getting them to commit to this common cause so do you see these mechanisms or these instruments of leadership also changing and how have they changed see they're, they're in a constant flux i would say they're constantly changing and, uh, to take off, take forward your own example if you look at covid and if you look at our own vaccination success right right uh, on one side, it's very easy to say our public sector, Anganwadi workers, A&Ms, Ashas, everybody delivered. That's the easiest way to say it. They did deliver. Okay. And there's no, but then there's also the fact that private sector also joined, in this, joined the bandwagon. Right. They might have been paid some small amount. Uh, for some hospital, it might have covered the cost. Some hospital may not have covered the cost to give free vaccinations to citizens. So the private sector also rose to the occasion, generated, produced these vaccines, did the right. R&D, generated the vaccines, and later on you can always go back and say they made some money. But then end of the day, they all jumped into the bandwagon as one team. Right. I think this whole understanding of learning to work together is a very powerful skill set, hmm. which we talk about. And I'll, I'll just expand on it a little bit. Hmm. The crisis and the response to the crisis itself was multi-sectoral. It was not just multi-departmental. Yes. Right? The private sector, the public sector, and the civil society organizations had to raise together to start responding. And what I noticed coming from civil society background was the boundaries were very blurred. Right. The margins just got blurred. I couldn't really, and, and nine months ago when I joined the government, I suddenly realized it's not much of a difference. Like 30 years ago when I was part of a strong activist movement, we always saw ourselves as we and them. Hmm. The state was always separate. We never really owned the state, neither the state owners. But I can say with conviction today that is not the case, which means a new set of skill sets in people who are dealing with us. And I can see the state maturing faster, the public sector leadership maturing much faster than the so-called societal, social, uh, civil society leadership, because we still are caught in a fossilized mind frame. Hmm. So the skill sets we needed were completely new, a toolbox of collaborative skills, toolbox of understanding I may not have the answers. Hmm. The state always had answers. 
Yeah. You have a problem, the state is there to solve. But today the state says, I don't know. Let's figure it out together. Okay. So I think co-generating a solution right. by co-owning a problem is a big shift. Yeah, that's Sometimes I feel we citizens may not be fully ready for it, but the state is asking for this shift because state actually believes citizens may have better answers. So we need to really look at how do I, but I, I don't fully also say that everybody in the public sector has this uncanny knack of getting people on board. Hmm. They're learning. Hmm. And that's why the Capacity Building Commission gets in and we're building a lot of citizen-centric programs, understanding citizens and all that hmm. today. So to me, whether it's the skills of collaboration, whether it's skills of simple thing, allowing yourself to feel vulnerable. Right. Can the state even feel vulnerable? It's unthinkable anywhere in the, con in the world. No country in the world would say, but I think for us to say, well, we may not have all the answers, but we'd like to figure it out along with you, is a sort of expression of... Uh, I wouldn't say vulnerability in that crude sense, but a sense of it, openness, it, yeah. a sense of uh, giving you the freedom to say, I don't know, let me learn it from you. Mm -hmm. That takes humility. Self-awareness. Self-awareness, humility, and a very mindful space where you know that I need to get people on board with me to work. Right. So I think it's not collaboration in terms of just finding a real toolbox of technical solutions, sure. but something deeper to say, I respect you, I sure. understand your wisdom, and I really believe that communities have a lot to offer and I'm ready to, I bring some resources to the table with the clear mandate and intent that I may not have all the resources to solve the problem, but I seek you as a resource provider. I think that's a huge shift. And I see that strengthening in context like India. A lot of countries are going through this, but countries are doing it in piecemeal. Right. But a very uh, integrated, comprehensive uh, kind of a solution framework is what I think the state thought conceived as mission karma yogi and right. making us future ready. That's what future readiness means. And shifting, and for that you need a big shift. And right. in Prime Minister's words, shifting people from thinking about a rule-based approach, hmm. which is what providership and pro provisioning ship, you can satisfy that space. But if you're really getting into partnering, you've got to get into space of roles. And so karma yogi is all about, in the PM's words, moving mindsets from rule-based approaches to role-based approaches. Yeah. And that is very uniquely Indian. Fair enough. And I think that's very interesting. You know, so you talked about several things, right? So you, one was you talked about you're not a provider of a service, but you are orchestrating an ecosystem in some ways, right? That's coming together to provide that service. And that shift itself brings about several shifts in skills, right? Because you have to think strategically. You have to bring people together or, you know, institutions together. Uh, credible institutions to bring identify credible institutions mm -hmm. and bring them together and also give purpose and direction to several people in this process right and constantly learning and improving while making an impact so I at least those were some of the skills that I got gathered from this tell me a little bit about and you know especially in your role this would be interesting to understand um, I mean in the private sector we talk about change management all the time Right. We talk about how it's difficult for people who worked a certain way several years to, you know, start affecting change. But there are ways to do it. So I just wanted to understand what are some of the ways, you know, in which this kind of change can be affected. You know, change itself is a very uh, dicey word in my view. Sure. Uh, I would like to actually define change because people, the moment you use the word change, change is as though something has to alter, something has to be different from what you were doing. I personally believe change is not about change at all. Change is about figuring out what to preserve. Right. And I think uh, in the Indian context, in public leadership, the essen essential civilizational ethos of India is service. If I were to draw in, uh, from my icon uh, and my inspiration, Vivekananda, he says, the two national ideals for India are seva and tyaga, hmm. service and sacrifice. And sacrifice not giving up everything, but a lot more deeper than that. Right. And I think today the national narrative that we are all uh, that's been set for us by in Mission Karma Yogi by the government is actually redefining the seva bhav hmm. and and making every every not just every public servant expanding this thinking to every Indian say how do I feel part of this great team hmm. India hmm. to build this new India this extraordinary hmm. vision of a great country and how does everybody participate. So that, that is where I said in the earlier part of the conversation that even the understanding of public has changed. Right. You know, at one point of time, we could define public narrowly as be, who are people who are being paid by the public exchequer or people who draw their salaries from the public taxation revenues. But today, I think everybody who's got ownership over this country of ours and who believes that our nation needs to progress in a particular way is part of this fascinating public discourse. Right. 
and we are all we are all in it together and this expanding team india context to me i think that is that is something very interesting and it's a, it, it, it's a great development sure so can we also talk balu specifically about some of the channels for this you know affecting this change clearly the cbc is a you know the capacity building commission is a exemplar uh, institution right that's a reflection okay. of the need for this change or the commitment to such change so can you talk a little bit about you know specific mechanisms initiatives to bring about this change it could be incentives it could be structures it could be processes but can we talk a little bit about what are some of these initiatives see specifically uh, this this whole packaging of driving change like what we spoke about and not change not being change at all but yes. preserving the essential service attitude Correct. and enhancing but reinventing yeah, it that's the karma yoga reason. part of right. it and the, the 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 part that all of us understand and know about from childhood but here how it's being done is it's actually done through a mechanism there's a structural mechanism to it and there's a functional mandate the capacity building commission is considered the heart and soul of this mission karma yogi with a functional mandate to deliver sure the structural mechanism is we are overseen by uh, headed by the prime minister it's called the prime minister's hr council which to which we report and 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 that is a council which is mandated with the entire responsibility of overseeing this entire process and then we need to be practical too i think it's been conceived very well like we are an independent executive commission but then end of the day this institutionalization of what we are doing is what is going to decide whether we'll succeed or not right. and the institutionalization needs to happen in existing structures and frameworks and that is why you have a cabinet coordination unit headed right. by the cabinet secretary so the, the entire bureaucracy headed by him and he coordinating this coordination unit is the executive implementing organ of everything that emerges from mission karma yogi but more fascinating is india is catching up with the rest of the world and we may possibly have the world's largest learning management system is this integrated government online training platform what is called i got right it's a exclusive section 8 company it's just been created and i think in a few months it will be fully rolled out with six different hubs in it it's a technology platform completely digital and and the whole thing is any time anywhere any instrument any person learning kind of a space which can not only produce a lot of material for itself and put it on board and we'll be curating and making sure we'll approve it but we'll be partnering with some wonderful partners including ISB and others who can help us get the best of material for the indian context and which the, the government people can also access it's not just the edx and chorus of chorus yes, of the yes, world of but this, we can create our own indian yes, contextually relevant material so i got will have all these hubs and what will be focusing on a two three fundamental shifts that we're having now every individual in the public sector is basically joining public service because we presume is joining it because he wants to work and contribute to the nation and i would always start from trust that yes. we trust him to come into the system to do, give something back to the country especially in post 2004 when pensions are no longer the norm there's no pension in the state system now if people are still inspired to come and take salaries much lesser than the private sector highly qualified competent people from the best of indian institutions but why are they doing it they're doing it because they really want to give back something so let's start from that so there is the we look at motives what motivates an individual to actually come and give so much to the country our job at the capacity building commission is to discover channels and mechanisms to sustain this motivation throughout the career lifelong learning yes right not only enable lifelong learning but create lifelong working spaces and ambiences right. and hygiene factors which keeps him motivated motivated second is he may be motivated but does he have the means to be delivering on his motivation i may be extremely inspired i may be a right. physician but do i even understand suppose i'm i'm as a doctor i'm just posted to an education sector right i may not have all the skill sets i need to deliver so we look at the means and say what is the what are the toolbox he needs what's the toolkit he needs to deliver on this concretely right right no you might give me the toolbox you might actually i might send people to isb and they may get trained in managerial issues and they come back but what if i don't post them in locations where i can use the skill sets that they acquired so we look at the motives we look at the means of actually enabling him to do, deliver public leadership and public work and the opportunity that's created for it now sure. in the past people would go abroad get trained come back and god knows where they were and we never really use them for the skills it's not their mistake we never use them for the skills that they had but today it's not going to happen that way we go and look at it the other thing that we are going to look at is we are looking at uh, the other channel we are looking at is we are trying to understand how does work look like hmm. the commission is not just about capacity building but to build capacity we need to understand what the future of work itself correct now the the school i teach at cornell is ilr school where the mandate is look at the future of work correct how how will 
how will public sector work look like one year from now, three years from now, five years from now, what are the kind of skill sets we need. So we, to make it more practical, we have aligned it to the national aspirations set by the Prime Minister, whether it's Atmanir Bharate or $5 trillion economy or ease of living or emerging technologies. How prepared are we to deliver on the national aspirations? Sure. And, and then that is a work if you define it. And what's a workplace look like? So part of the mandate of the Commission is also to look at policies. So we have not started work on that. And once we start working on that and say what can enable, create an enable environment for expression of this public leadership. And the last is the work person or the worker. That, that is what, that's the easy low-lying apple in my view, and that's what we're focusing on right now, is how do you build capacities? And there we look at three levels of competencies. So we are now looking at, to ensure that you're motivated enough, what are behavioral competencies that can keep you inspired? Hmm. So we can, this, this I got can have as a competency hub, right. which can actually map it for you, and you'll get a list of what you're good at and what you're not so good at. And what do you need? What are the set of courses you can do Right. that you can actually fulfill those uh, needs. Right. The second is we look at what we call functional competencies. Right. Now let's say I'm a joint secretary. As a joint secretary, I have some functions to perform or as an under secretary, I have some functions to perform. The job description that I have, some KPIs I have to deliver on. And the competencies I need to do that job well. Now it doesn't matter where I'm joint secretary. Wherever I am, my functions will be the same. But then there are also certain domains I'm posted in. Like I may be in education today, health tomorrow. Right now, you are in education today, great. Tomorrow you are in health, God help you. But it's not going to be like that. Now we are saying that if you've got to shift your domains, a set of courses, that minimum courses you acquire and do, and therefore acquire the competency and then get into that space. Fair so enough. we'll be connecting it to your, your, you know, the, your career opportunities, your career growth. So there's a career hub also embedded in IGOT, where you can have spaces to discover what is it that you are good at and you can possibly attempt to qualify to do. Sure. So we are looking at all these level of competency. So that's one way of doing it. The technology platform is one, the brick and mortar institutions are one. Sure. So the supply and the demand side. To just complete the loop for you, what we're also doing is we're working with each ministry. And we, we work with them from the commission, help build a capacity building plan. Hmm. Working with them, it is their plan. We're hmm. just facilitating developing it. But what are we doing this for is to deliver on the national aspirations. Sure. And we map it out for them, we help them, we are embedding a capacity building unit in these ministries who will be the central nodal point to keep this alive. So training is not, we don't even want to use the word training honestly. We think it's capacity building. We build capacities at the individual level, the institutional or the ministry level and the entire systemic government level to deliver on the national aspirations mandated by the Prime Minister. So we are looking at how do we create this, how do we do this all the time. So the demand side, we understand them and then say we'll meet those demands. So they come up and tell us, well, we are overseeing the infrastructure project and we need help in these eight things, then if we think one of our knowledge partners, let's say ISB has got these four things to offer us, we'll come to you and say, can you help us out in these four things? Got so it. that's the way we are doing, we're also playing a matchmaker. That, that, that's how we address the supply side. Supply side, we are addressing to two, three channels. One channel is our own. The government of India has got 25 central training institutes and several institutes across the country. Totally, we have around 800 of them. We're looking at these brick and mortar institutions and maximizing it beyond the digital space. How do you maximize these uh, opportunities? Sure. We're also looking at IGOT sure. and we're looking at knowledge partners. We want to build knowledge partners of top class institutions across this country. There's several of them today yes. and see how they can participate in this national journey. And it's, it's, it's sort of, I would say it's an obligation also because all of us are in it together. Yeah. So these are the different channels we are trying to put sure. together and it's a huge complex thing. But I try to simplify and it, it as much as I can. it also seems like it, this has to be done at multiple levels, right? Yes. Because you need, I mean, you have functional leadership, it seems, you, at, you know, at, the, at, at, the, at a certain level. At the mid-level, you need more, you know, the ability for team leadership and things like that. And at the higher levels, you also need strategic leadership, Absolutely. right? So there is, there, it's, so if one of them is done in the absence of the other, the organization doesn't realize it doesn't its work. impacts. And, and that's, that's a big shift, I think. Earlier, the focus was on the group pay officers. Hmm. Today, we're focusing on 3.1 million people, out of which only 30,000 or so are group pay officers. Right. But everybody matters. The Correct. Prime Minister keeps saying everybody's part of Team India. Correct. So group B, group C, and group A, all Correct. of them matter to us. The Holistic focus that was there predominantly on group A is no longer going to be there. I'm not saying we're going to remove the focus, but we're going to bring focus to the levels of the group A, to group B, and group C also. Right. So, so that holistically, there is that, that absorption approach is taken, of knowledge. Yeah. Correct. And also, it seems like there is, you know, a lot of this um, needs to be measured continuously. 
evidence-based training, right? So I know you've talked about the fact that can we assess impact, and not impact in traditional terms, but impact in terms of has it actually changed behaviors, actions, outcomes, results on the ground. Uh, and then using that to inform training, which I think was your piece on yes. uh, policies and learning and training. I know I, that, that's something which is again uh, very few people have attempted it because it's, it, the complexity of measuring training. I think I'm talking yeah. talking to the converted <laughs> and the experts. What the way I look at it is, uh, it's easy to measure a training program. Yes, yes. No, that's easy for all of us. Correct. But then to go deeper and say, Correct. what are the cognitive attainment? How is the cognitive attainment translating as behavioral change in the person? And the, the combination of all this, how is it actually bringing impact on the ground Correct. and changing citizens' lives? Correct. So in a simple way, all this can be the background processes that we are all focusing on. Because does the training even make a difference? Should we even be running these programs? Is it even necessary? So right from whether the designing the program to delivering it, focusing on all the adult learning principles, looking at all that, that's the easy part. Hmm. But the complexity comes in, is it making a difference on citizens' lives? Hmm. We are a complex country, very diverse, and hmm. we are heterogeneous, and we are we are part of the national government, hmm. where the citizen-centric service delivery is very uh, far lesser than the states, right. and we don't have mandates over the states. So we might build a citizen-centric environment and ecosystem, but unless the states also sort of participate in this and come on board in hmm. this, that change at that level. That's a that's the level in which prime minister seeks impact. Right. He says, does citizens' lives become better? Right. In what way is that happening? So if you keep that as a benchmark, we have to really go deep and long and right. invest a lot on it. But the journey has begun right. and we're doing the easier, I won't say it's easy, but the easier parts now. But eventually we'll do measure impact at the ground and say that these are the end consequence of the kind of inputs and capacities we're creating. And capacities also not only are complex but also very dynamic. Right. They're so fluctuant. That's that, the other thing, right? right? This is not a one-time effort or a point in time. Exactly. This has to be continually, which also brings in the Im the role of impact, right? So, because you cannot improve what you cannot yeah. measure. So, I guess there is an effort to continually do At this. Least I can say this much. We are extremely aware that we need to have very nuanced and refined instruments. Right. And that is where we are actually looking. That's why we need the knowledge partners, right? right? And right. we are not interested in doing it ourselves because we know there is academic strength, intellectual bandwidth embedded in the systems in the country. How do we capitalize on them, the higher, our own higher education institutions, repurpose them and give them new meaning right. and see if we can bring them on board to see these kind of, uh, explore these questions. Now, research can be in so many di different yes, ways, absolutely. right? And this absolutely. is one way which you can go deeper. Yeah. And this actually is, is, is it, it, it also redefines relations in some ways between academia and... It, it makes right? us more relevant and societal. Absolutely. Uh, and which is very, very refreshing. Uh, I wanted to close with, you know, a personal question, which is, I mean, you've, you've, you know, from civil society to academia to now government, how is this? This is this seems obviously a very fulfilling journey, but I'm sure there are also challenges, right? So, do you want to talk a little bit about how this journey has been, and you know, what were some of the things that surprised you? What are some of the things that came to you intuitively, and how, in general, how you know your overall commentary on this? I'm going to close with that. Yeah. See, I know at least my journey began with seeing the state as a failure. Hmm. You know, many of us belong to a generation where we thought we have to sup we have to supplant the state. The state has failed. So I graduated as a physician and as a medical student I started this organization. I was very clear, my inspiration came from Vivekananda's writings about wanting to give back to the nation. And I thought the only way I could give back was complete my medicine, go into a village and stay in a forest. So 25 years I lived with indigenous tribal communities, much like them, amongst them, with them, the best years of my life. So at first hand, the naked exploitation of the system on the, th mm. on the indigenous communities of this country. Got very pissed off, upset, became a declared activist, sued people, sued the state, went to the Human Rights Commission. My journey was an activist, like any other activist, but we did it all within constitutional frameworks. And that's where it reassured to me that Indian systems work. Right. So won the battles. At some point of time, I started questioning the very understanding of human development, because the narrative was in the 90s. They said trickle down, but nothing trickled down, except <laughs> problems trickled down, but the benefits of the so-called provisioning never really came in because the, the, the society that I was living in were not invested on or prepared by the state to take the benefits of the trickle down. Right. So it became a very urban-centric economic design, which irritated me and pissed me off. Then I said, what do I do now? So I, at that point of time, believed acquiring academic degrees will help me solve it. So I thought maybe if I understood management a little bit. So my MPhil was on strategic management and understanding how strategic management works. And I thought maybe if I can strategically think of India's future, it will help. 
did public health programs. I thought I could solve public health issues. But then I, every step I took, it helped me a bit. But I was still restless and unresolved in my answers. Because I couldn't find answers for why tribals were poor in the first place. How could communities whose understanding of poverty is very different suddenly be poor? Right. And in search for these answers, and most of it I've written about it in my books, I then thought, well, it's Mecca of learning. If I go to the best place in the world which can teach me human development, I can learn about it. So I went to Harvard, degrees and fellowships later. I realized that they may not have the answers for me, but they definitely had me asking questions differently. Hmm. And I realized most of the answers were embedded in community wisdom in India itself. They are all within me or within the community I was working in, living in. I didn't, my antennas were not sensitive to pick them. Hmm. And that is when I started writing. So if hmm. you look at my voices from the grassroots, etc., I unabashedly and unapologetically confess that everything I've learned is from communities. It's ex hmm. just that we didn't have confidence and, and the self-respect to even understand that we have so much of knowledge embedded in it. That was our transition. So I, then I thought this has to be shared with everybody. But even at that stage of my life, I believe these sectors were rigid compartments. I mm -hmm. come from civil society. So this is how I conduct myself, this is how I behave. I come and, and then there's a government I deal with. So that's a public right. sector. Then right. CS, post CSR, it became much more open. This is the private sector and I got to deal with them. Private sector, in my mind, were ruthless sinners. And, and it took me a long while to realize everybody is part of the game. So to me, that was my growth. I suddenly realized that you can't really, s I can't supplant anybody, I can at best supplement people. And if I don't learn to work in partnership, I'm going to be a stumbling block in the progress of the nation itself or the communities I serve. So if I truly believed in working with communities, I need to learn partnership. So my thinking opened up and I said, how do I learn to work with others? That's a skill I didn't have because, you know, I think activists are, we are driven by egos. Hmm. Much more than what I thought. Uh, I always believe everybody is, but I think the civil society groups are pretty much. We are all very individualistic. We are passionate. We believe we are the doing the right stuff. But the problem is we also start believing we are the only ones doing the right stuff. Right. And so I had those blinds too, and I'll confess I had it. And then it took me some time to realize no, everybody matters. Everybody is important. It is just that there's nobody else to educate the other. Right. So from a from a confrontational advocate, I became a collaborative advocate. Even a lot of my civil society friends thought I sold myself, but I think that is a good move I need. I said that unless we partner with the system, whether it's private sector or public sector, and create this new fourth sector thinking, right. where we draw the DNA of all the sectors, put it all together, we can't really bring about change. Sure. So today being in government, I think I got into government at an appropriate time when uh, the system led by the prime minister believes that we need skill sets of all kinds. And if you look at the capacity building commission itself, we are a fascinating combination. Our chairman comes from private sector and private sector consulting. Uh, my colleague uh, Praveen comes from uh, the, uh, the IAS and the bureaucracy and understands public sector very intimately and he's been a go-getter in his own way. Uh, I come from civil society and academia and the secretary of the commission, Hemang, comes from uh, World, Bank. World Bank experience and having worked in the political systems of the country and right. as OSD to the prime minister. So we bring in skill sets which possibly every institution needs. Right. So aggregation of our skill sets are very powerful and I think you need that kind of an approach to solve problems of today. So I am very comfortable doing what I'm doing, mainly because if the cause is same, if the intent is this national service, it doesn't matter which sector you are in. Right. And if your attitude is karma yoga, right. I think mission karma yoga is the best place to be in. Right. So to me, I feel very comfortable now. I don't feel out of place. Because I don't see it as government being separate from me. I right. see it as an integral part of a national solution that we need to give ourselves as the people of India. Right. And so that's been that's the journey I've had. Which also draws on all your identities as an academic, as a, yeah, as a as civil, civil society, society, as an activist. activist. Yeah. One of my friends, when I joined, a close friend said, uh, he reminded me and said, now you're wearing a new hat. Uh, try not to be an activist in the system. But then I realized that is not... Uh, I, I think the better advice would have, for me would have been be a more nuanced activist because all of us are activists in our own way. Academics too. Yeah. Exactly, right? <laughs> right. We are all in our own ways. Right. How, do you, how do you repackage it or program yourself in a way in which you make a meaningful difference, a productive right. difference? It's not activism for activism's okay. sake, but for something good for the country. Right. And I think that's the opportunity presented and um, it's, a, it's a great place to work. 
Thank you, Balu. Yeah. That was wonderful. And I'm hoping that this was an insightful session. I definitely enjoyed this. Thank and you. And thank you so much for... You As know, always, uh, pleasure talking to you. And thank, thank you. you so much. And pleasure coming to ISB, more important. Thank you so much.